ask you a question. I, I often like to uh, begin messages with questions. And have you ever had an experience where you just said, I, I encountered something where I just couldn't even? All right, are you, you all familiar with that? Right? Couldn't even. Or you were just like, just, this is just a just wow moment. Right? We used to say, this is just, I can't even, I can't wrap my mind. This is so off. Well, I think we probably all had that experience. And as we dive into the book of, of Galatians this morning, Paul is writing to a group of churches that were located in a region where he had been before in Galatia, where he had self-established and planted churches. And he is writing to them because he's heard that since he has left there, they are turning away from or being tempted to turn away from the gospel. They're being tempted to turn away from the good news of the gospel that Paul had brought to them and preached to them, the good news that it had impacted and transformed their lives. And so Paul, is, as he writes this letter, we're going to find Paul is, is very passionate. Now, if, if you're familiar with the Bible and you're familiar with the writings of Paul, it's not a surprise that, that Paul is passionate because you can get the, 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 the understanding that Paul is a passionate person. Like, I'm a big Philadelphia Eagles fan. We got any Eagles fans? Go Earth, baby. All right. All right. And, you know, I think Paul would have made an awesome Eagles fan, all right? He had the passion, right? He had that, that drive and that energy. And so it's not surprising that, that we find Paul passionate. But in the letter of Galatians, we see that, that there, there's even a, a, an enhancement of his passion. Right? And he, he's so passionate because, you know, what gets your emotions flowing? Right? When, I want you to just think about this. What, what gets you, you know, what gets you fired up? What... what What's one thing that just really, really makes you passionate? Yes? Frisbee. Frisbee. All right. And we'll have that later today. Right? But I, I think that the things that we have in common, because if we went around the room and I give all of you a chance to answer that question, we probably all have something different. But here's what we'd have in common. What is passionate to us is usually something that's personal to us. Right, things that you feel strongly about, areas where you have deep convictions or deep beliefs, and you know, when you're in a conversation, you can feel your energy gets up, your voice gets a little loud, you know, and, and so for some people, it's, it's talking about their faith or an aspect of their faith or politics or a strongly held belief right, that we get passionate about. And, and for Paul, he was passionate about the gospel, the good news, that Jesus was the Son of God that he came into this world and lived as a human being, although being fully God, that he died on a cross for our sins, that he rose from the dead on the third day, that he appeared to his followers, and that he ascended to heaven, and that he's coming again one day. And so for Paul, it was personal, because Paul was someone who didn't grow up a Christian. He, he actually grew up in the area where Jesus was alive, but he did not become a follower of Jesus. In fact, Paul hated Jesus and his followers because he thought they were a false division of Judaism. They, they were an illegitimate sect, and he thought that they were nothing but a problem to be eliminated. And so Paul's passion was actually directed towards persecuting Christians. Right? He is present when, he is present when, when people are stoned and murdered. Right? And he is, the Bible says in Acts that he was causing havoc in the church, right? And so for Paul, his, his passion was to do anything he could to disrupt or discredit or destroy Christians. He hated it. And he thought that he was doing all of that in the name of God. But then something happened, and Paul encountered the risen Christ. And Paul realized that Jesus was who he claimed to be. And Paul's life was transformed by the simple truth that although Paul was a great sinner, Jesus was a great Savior. And Paul's life was changed forever. And because of that, this letter is intensely personal. Because as he writes to these believers, they were being tempted by false teachers to drift away from the gospel, to, to not cling to and claim the gospel message. And so Paul's going to write to these, these Christians to challenge them, to get their attention, to not turn away from the gospel. And so this week, that's going to be our theme as we trace through the grace of God that's made available to us through the gospel and our need to cling tightly to that truth, that gospel, that good news. So as we, uh, as we see that, uh, I, I want us to, to, to have that in mind. And, you know, it's interesting as we come to Galatians, usually Paul 
would give a rather warm greeting in his letters. And so he would introduce, he would share grace and peace as he did in Galatians. But then he would usually give some sort of warm greeting. I, I have a fond affections for you. I'm praying for you. But, but in the book of Galatians, there is no warm greeting. And it wasn't because he didn't love them. But there was an urgent issue. And, you know, when there's an urgent issue, you don't have time for a warm greeting. I, I was thinking about it like this. You know, how many of you had a parent who told you not to touch a hot stove or run out in the street? All right. And how many of you had a moment... Uh, how many of you had a moment where, where maybe you were about to do something very dangerous and your parents yelled out, stop? Anybody? All right? Yeah. All right. So we're all pretty familiar with that. You know, there's no time for a warm greeting, is there? Right? If my child was about to touch a hot stove, I wouldn't say, now, honey, right? I love you so much. I'm so proud of you. You're such an amazing child. I don't, but I, I, you know, you're about to do something full. Right? That would be what? That would be crazy, wouldn't it? Right? Because there's no time for that. And so that's what we're going to see in, in the book of Galatians. There's just diving into the issue. So if you have your Bible, Galatians chapter 1 will begin uh, in verse 6. Paul says this, uh, and we'll look at verses 6 and 7. He says, I'm amazed, or I'm shocked, that you're so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to change the gospel of Christ. And so if Paul gets right to the issue, he says, I'm shocked. Right? And, and I think for Paul, he wasn't shocked that there may be some that were drifting away. But he says, I'm shocked that you're so quickly turning away from the grace of God, from the gospel. Right? He says, the, the grace that I preach to you, the, the good news that, that although, yes, you are sinful people like everyone, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? There isn't anyone who hasn't violated God's standards or God's ways, right? All of us have, you, me, everyone you've ever encountered, right? When, as soon as we are old enough, right, we have the inclination towards sin, towards rebellion. No one had to teach us to do that, right? No one had to tell you to tell your parents no, did they, right? No one had to tell you to be disrespectful or any of those things. And so all of these ways that we have violated God's ways, but... Jesus came, right, to bear the curse and the consequence of our sin, that we might be forgiven freely, to be justified, to be declared righteous in God's eyes, to be restored to a relationship with him, that we would know him and experience his goodness and his grace. It's why you were made, right? You are a human being, right? I, I, I'm going to assume that of all of you, right? right? I, I know assumptions can be dangerous, but is that a safe assumption? All right. I don't think we have any aliens among us. All right. You as a human being, you were made in the image of God, right? You were created, you were formed and fashioned in the very image of your creator. You have value and worth because of the fact that you're a human being, that you were designed to be a being that could know God, designed to be a being that would reflect God, that you would be his image bearers in this world. Sin, right, distorts our ability to bear his image. It distorts and, and it... And it Cuts off our capacity to be in relationship with a holy God. But through Jesus Christ, we have been restored. The gospel restores us to our purpose. It restores us to who we are, our true identity. And so for Paul, as he's writing this, he says, I'm shocked that after hearing the good news, that you don't have to earn it, that it's not about keeping the rules, that you don't have to be a good person and earn God's love or God's favor. You don't have to perform great rituals. You don't have to do anything other than acknowledge your sinfulness and your Savior's sacrifice and believe in faith on Him and to trust Him. And when that happens, Paul would say that the Holy Spirit comes to live in you and He changes you and begins to transform you and you belong to Him. He adopts you. You become His child. You become an heir of His kingdom and His glory. You get, become connected to Him and a life of purpose. And so for Paul, this was so personal, right? Because he used to hate Christians and he used to hate the church. He thought it was foolishness. And he came to realize it was true. And so he's so passionate because they were leaving the gospel. He says, I'm, I'm shocked that you're turning away to a different gospel. And the issue here is going to be that there were some coming in and saying, no, you, you just can't believe on Christ and be saved. You have to become Jewish. You have to be circumcised if you're male. You, you have to go back and you have to keep the law too and believe in Jesus. And for Paul, he would say, no, that's not the message of the gospel. The gospel is simple. And it's for everyone, Jew and Gentile. And the only way into God's kingdom, the only way into God's family, is through faith in Christ. 
right? That, that there's no other pathway. And so they were drifting away. And he says, there's no other gospel. There's no other good news. Although you might hear a message that sounds like good news. And he says, there are some, look at verse 7, who are troubling you. And they want to change the gospel of Christ. And so Paul was shocked. Now, for us, the issue today might not be a tendency to go back to the law, right? Our, our, our challenge might not be saying, I'm tempted to go back and follow Jewish law, the Old Testament law, in order to be saved. But today, like then, there's a temptation for all of us to drift away from the gospel. And there could be a lot of reasons for that. But there's temptations to modify the gospel, to add to it or to take away from it, to distort it. And I think that's because although the gospel is extraordinarily good news, you can't get good news without having what? Bad news. And a lot of times we don't want to hear the bad news. And we don't want to hear the truth. We don't want to hear a message that we are sinful people. We don't want to hear a message that we have a problem that we can't fix, that we need a Savior. And so darkness often resists light. The gospel confronts our pride, right? It confronts our, our ability to do anything to help ourselves. You know, we love to be able to take care of ourselves, right? If you're a firstborn, you probably really love to handle it by yourself, don't you? Right? You have independence. You're strong, right? And, and that's a good thing, but the gospel confronts our pride. We cannot do anything to fix ourselves. And so Paul had a strong reaction. Right? He, he had a strong reaction to this. Why? Because it's so important. Look at verse 8 and verse 9. He says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel other than what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. As we have said before, and I now say again, if anyone preaches to you a gospel contrary to what you received, a curse be on him. Now that's pretty intense, isn't it? Right, for, for a Monday morning, right? And here's Paul. And he's like, if someone comes to you, even if an angel of heaven came to you and preached a gospel that was anything different than what I preached to you, that Jesus was the Son of God, that he lived for you, that he died for you, that he rose from the dead, that he appeared to his followers, that he ascended, that he sits at the Father's right hand, and he's coming again for his church, for his people one day in power and in glory. He says, if anyone comes and preaches a gospel that's different than that, if they add from it, if they take away from it, he says, let them be cursed. Let them be cut off from God. Basically, he's saying, let them go to hell. Right? And you say, man, that's, that's pretty extreme, Paul. That's pretty intense. But this isn't just a hot take. This isn't an overreaction. Right? We live in a world of hot takes and overreactions, don't we? Right? I mean, as soon as people hear something, they, you see something on social media, you see something in the news, and all of a sudden, everyone has an instant, fully formed opinion about something they probably don't know anything about. Right? Have you ever encountered that? And so we live in that world of reactionary takes and hot takes. And so we might say, man, is this, is this just Paul, you know, having an over-the-top emotional comeback? Is, is he just being a little extra, if you will? Are you with me? No. Right? This is not a, a, a reactionary take. This is not just a hot take. This is life and death passion that's coming from Paul. Because this is real for him. This is personal for him. And it was so close to Paul's heart. You see, the things that we're passionate about are the things that are close to our heart, the things that are personal. And for Paul, this is personal. Jesus made it very clear. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? John chapter 14, verse 6. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, the gospel, the good news, is a very exclusive invitation. Because there's only one way. There's only one door. There's not many ways and not many doors. There's one way and one door. And Jesus said he was that door. Jesus is the only way to go. There's no other way. But it's also a very inclusive message. Because Jesus said, whosoever will may come. And so the message is for everyone. It's inclusive. But it's exclusive. There's only one way to come. Paul goes on and look at verses 10. Look at verse 10. He says, For am I now trying to win the favor of people or God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a slave of Christ. Now, question for you. Any people pleasers here this morning? All right, just confession. All right. Raise it up. All right. My hand's up too. Right? I struggle with this. Right? I want people to like me. I want people to accept me. My middle school years scarred me. Anybody else? All right. 
And so to this day, I worry about what people think about me, or do people like me, or what do they think about this or that, and, and, and that's normal and natural. But we can never let our desire to be liked or accepted be at the expense of truth. And for Paul, he said, you know, I, I don't want to have to confront you about this, right? I, and I know that you could, there's a risk when you confront someone that they're going to reject you, right? There, there's a risk when you confront someone that they'll push back. And Paul said, you know what, I, you know, notice he said, if I were still trying to please people, right? That Paul would say there was a time that I really cared about what other people thought about me. I cared about my image. I cared about how I looked, how I was perceived, what other people thought about me. And that's normal, right? I, I know all about that struggle. But Paul said, now that I've ex received acceptance from Christ, from the God of the universe who loved me and gave himself for me, through his son, Jesus Christ, he says, I don't, have to, I don't have to be a people pleaser anymore. He says, because if I am, I'm not a servant or a slave of Christ. And so confrontation here is necessary. And, and never should we think that love comes at the expense of truth. So Paul goes on and he shares a little bit about his testimony, verse 11 and 12. He says, now I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel preached to me is not based on a human point of view, for I did not receive it from a human source. And I was not taught, taught it, but it came by revelation from Jesus Christ. Right? Paul said that the gospel that I'm preaching, I, I didn't make it up. I didn't learn it in school. Nobody catechized me. I, I didn't learn it. He says, for me, he says, it came by a revelation. Right? And we know about that revelation in the book of Acts. Jesus literally appears to Saul while he's on the way to a city called Damascus in Syria. He's on his way there to round up Christians, to rip, literally rip them out of their homes and carry them off to prison for following Jesus. And Jesus intersects his life, and he calls him out, but he also offers him his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. And so for Paul, he had a supernatural conversion to Christ. And here's the thing, anyone who has come to faith in Christ, you've had a supernatural conversion. God has revealed himself to you. We wouldn't come to him if he didn't come to us. And so I've been praying for you, right? And I, I shared a little bit about this last night from Ephesians chapter one that God would reveal himself to you while you're here. That wherever you're at in your spiritual journey, if you'd say, man, I, I'm someone who, man, I know Jesus is my savior. I love him. I've been born again. I have a living hope in me and I want to follow him. I'm praying for you that God will take you even deeper into who he is and his love for you and his purpose for your life and his call on your life. If you say, I, 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 I've placed my faith in Christ, but man, I'm really struggling. I'm praying that God will reveal himself to you so that you will grow. If you say, I, I, I have questions, I'm kind of skeptical, I'm not sure if I'm a believer, I'm praying that God will reveal himself to you. And if you're saying, I don't even care about God, but my parents sent me here, I'm praying that God will reveal himself to you because Paul didn't care about Christ either. But he changed his life and he saved him. And God did an amazing work in his life. So I've been praying that God will reveal himself to you. I shared a little bit about this last night, but 27 years ago on this very campus, right? This dining room wasn't even open then, right? It, it opened the next year, 26 years ago. But on this campus, God changed my life. God revealed himself to me in a way that I had known him as savior. I'd been baptized. I, I knew that. I knew I belonged to Christ, but I wasn't really living for him. I didn't have a passion for him. I really, it came out of a desire to fit in or to follow the crowd, or to be accepted. And it wasn't until I came here that I realized that I had all the acceptance that I needed in Christ. And that I found acceptance from brothers and sisters in Christ. And I saw other people who loved Jesus and wanted to follow Jesus. And, and God revealed himself to me. So I'm praying that what God did for me, he'll do for you. Paul goes on with his testimony. Verses 13 and 14. He says, For you have heard about my former way of life in Judaism, I persecuted God's church to an extreme degree. I tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many contemporaries among my people because I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. Paul said, I, I've always been passionate, but I wasn't passionate about the truth. I was, I was passionate about traditions. I was passionate about things that I thought were true. But Jesus showed me what was really true. He was true. And he was the way. He was the truth. He was the life. And he says, it changed everything for me. Look at verse 15 and 16. He says, But when God, who from my mother's womb set me apart and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I could preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. 
Again, he was saved by a revelation of who God was. And verse 17, he says, I did not go up to Jerusalem with those who became apostles before me. But instead, I went to Arabia and came back to Damascus. And then after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to get to know Cephas. And I stayed with him for 15 days. But I did not see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And so Paul's basically saying, again, I, this gospel that, you know, this, this gospel that I'm writing to you about, that I'm telling you don't drift away from, don't, don't leave. He says, I didn't get it from a human source. I, I didn't, again, learn it from anyone. I, I received it directly from Jesus that I saw, I witnessed. Look at verse 20. He says, now in what I write to you, I'm not lying. God is my witness. For afterwards I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I remained personally unknown to the Judean churches in Christ. They simply kept hearing, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith he once tried to destroy. And verse 24 says, and they glorified God because of me. John, if we could just shift gears for a second, in his gospel, right, John was one of the original followers of Jesus, invited to be one of the twelve, an eyewitness to Jesus' life, to his ministry, to his miracles, to his teaching, and ultimately to his death and his resurrection. And John said this, he said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we observed his glory, the glory of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so here's what I, my heart is for you this morning, is that the one who became flesh and revealed his glory among us, the one that was full of grace and truth, would reveal himself to you. That you would know his glory and his worth and his majesty. That you would know his grace that forgives and sustains and transforms. And that you would know the truth of who he is and what his call is and purpose is for your life. Paul had a passion, a fire for the gospel. And he didn't want anyone to drift away from it. And I want you to see three truths, three things. I want to give you three points. Right? Some of my messages will have points and some of them will be pointless. All right? I'll let you figure out which ones. Three things. First of all, we see the primacy of the gospel in this message. Right? The primacy of the gospel. Right? Paul had to confront this drift away from the truth because nothing was more important than this. This is where it all, all starts. The foundation of our faith. The foundation of everything that we believe and that Paul believed was built on who was Jesus. Right? There's not a more important question that you will ever ask or answer in life than who is Jesus Christ. Was he who he claimed to be? And I believe the evidence points to that. Not only the evidence in history, the evidence in the Bible, the evidence I've experienced personally in my relationship with him points to the reality that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He was and is the Son of God. He loves you and he loved me. And because of that love, he went to a cross willingly. And he died for you and he died for me and he died for the world. And he offers us forgiveness and grace. He offers us relationship to be adopted, to be accepted, to be redeemed, to be clothed in his righteousness, to know him, to know purpose, to know his peace, and to know him and to live with him forever, to experience victory over the curse of sin and death. And so the gospel is first, it's prime. The primacy of the gospel is something we have to cling to. Number two, the power of the gospel. Because right? Paul would tell you, I was religious. I was very religious. I was more religious than anyone I knew. But I didn't need, religion couldn't change my heart. Right? Just, just intellectual beliefs couldn't change anything. He said, I had to encounter the power of the gospel. Listen, the gospel is powerful. The power of the gospel can save you and transform you and change you, sanctify you. Right? The gospel is power. It's the power of God unto salvation. Paul would say to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And number three, the, the purpose of the gospel. Notice, notice how he finished up. Remember, as he said, the people in the churches that heard about Paul's conversion, right? They, they were amazed, right? Because, you know, if you were a believer in the first century when Paul was persecuting the church, he was the last name that you wanted to hear, right? Can you imagine being gathered together and you're like, Paul's on his way? And it would cause terror because Paul was coming to wreak havoc on the church, Paul was coming to round people up and have them thrown into prison and rip husbands away from wives and wives away from their mothers away from their kids. But now they said, this, this guy that used to persecute us, now, now he, he, he loves Jesus and he preaches Jesus. And they said they, they were amazed and they glorified God because of what he did. See, the purpose of the gospel ultimately is to bring glory to God. Right? That's, that's our purpose. Man's chief end is what? To glorify God and to enjoy him for what? forever. 
And so that's the purpose of the gospel. Paul started his letter, Galatians chapter 1, verse 5, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So it's my prayer that you would know the primacy of the gospel, not just as intellectual theory, but as a real experience. That you would know the power of the gospel and that you would live out the purpose of the gospel. And we'll be continuing that journey this week. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the love that you offer to every one of us. Love that is something that's more than we could comprehend or understand. Love that led you to give your son. Love that led the son to come to us and for us. To die in our place so that we could be restored, redeemed. So that we could become your children. So that we could glorify you with our lives. So Father, I pray for this day that's before us. Father, with all the excitement and energy that will go into the day, new music, new things, new experiences. Father, I pray it would be a great day of, of growth, of learning, of just diving into all that you have. I pray that it would be a day of joy and fun as well. But Father, I pray that it would be a day that, that we glorify you in all that we do. And I pray that everyone here would know the depth of your love for them, and that they would know the gospel, and that it would change their lives. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.